Hi, it's Mike with Ubtastic again. Today I'm sitting down with Ken Auer. Ken has been a uh, speaker on the object oriented uh, commu- uh, in the object oriented community for a very long time, and I first heard him talk at SCNA tw- 2009, where he talked a little bit about how he got into a speaking and teaching, and eventually mentoring through role model software um, it, with with the object oriented community. Uh, so, also he's a, a, a devout religious uh, person, Christian, and carries that faith into his teachings and his work through role model software. So we'll talk a little bit about how he got involved uh, with with teaching, how role model software came to be, and what some of his experiences have been uh, with sharing his faith as part of of his his uh, life and his teaching. So Ken, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me today. Glad to be here. So in 2009, uh, I was attending, I think it was the first SCNA conference, and I got a chance to hear you talk. And my recollection wasn't perfect. I thought you had uh, been inspired by some presentations you had heard by uh, 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 some some of the people who were starting the, the concepts of, of or promoting OO. But you corrected me to say that you had already been uh, working with OO. So can you tell me a little bit about how you got started and and what the what the real story was? Sure. Yeah, the uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I um, was hired uh, by a company called Paradigm, uh, which some people may have heard of. They actually invented DSL, but the, not back when I was working with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they were they hired me to help build uh, the next network management system. What and do you mean, one DSL? Of the, the, the marketing tech- guys. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you meant DSL the 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 the. Uh, uh, internet uh, communication. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, way back then, they were just dealing with high-speed modems, mm-hmm. um, but they wanted to build the next generation network management system, and uh, so I was there with a bunch of uh, exper- more experienced developers than I was, and we were all trying to figure out how do we build this in C. And this was a time when uh, workstations, like Sun Workstations, was just getting off the ground. Uh, Tektronics, HP, Digital, a couple of these guys had workstations. And we're just exploring what technology we could use. Um, we were wanted some something called a graphical user interface. The term GUI wasn't invented yet. Uh, you know, it realizes the '80s and the Mac had just came out, and uh, so one of the uh, marketing guys actually had read one of the three articles written about object-oriented programming at the time, and he said, "You know, you guys really should be looking into object-oriented programming." Um, when uh, I'm sorry. I should have muted this. Sorry, no problem. Can I mute this? I can. I can't. I hate that. How do I do that? That really stinks. I guess we'll edit that out. Anyway, um, the uh, he he had read one of the three articles on object oriented programming. He said, "You guys need to be looking at that." We all looked at each other and said, "What's object oriented programming?" Mm-hmm. So we went and read the three articles that were written on it and uh, said, this sounds pretty cool. We should look into this. And um, you know, we were a bunch of computer science grads, most of us. Uh, well, I shouldn't say most of us. Some of us were. Um, others had gotten to engineering programming through other means, and we had never heard of this thing. Mm-hmm. And we started studying it and looking into it and found out that Smalltalk ran on some of these workstations that we were looking at. And um, next thing you know, we were learning about it from uh, – the guys at Stepstone, which were actually the inventors of Objective C, because they believed that small talk could never be used in a commercial environment. Uh, we proved them wrong, but uh, we eventually started using Objective C and small talk, and it was kind of uh, interesting. So as as I'm doing this, I'm pretty new, 23, 24, um, getting my master's at night, and um, learning about object oriented technology in, uh, in the in the in my day job. And I'm going to these master's programs at night and seeing the academics uh, talking about the stuff that I'm supposedly need to know to be successful in my career. And they introduce object-oriented technology in, in a very academic way that had nothing to do with the objects we were dealing with. Mm-hmm. And uh, I finally said, you know what, I'm going to stop listening to the academics and uh, just pour my time into understanding this technology, which they don't seem to understand. Mm-hmm. Um, Little did I know, the first Oopsla conference was just being formed uh, the same year I just learned about objects. And um, 
OOPSA was Object Oriented Programming Systems and Languages, and it was a combination of academics and people trying to apply this mm -hmm. uh, application, right? And um, yeah, I very quickly got to meet the people who'd written the three books on Smalltalk. Um, you know, the folks out of Xerox Park um, met guys like Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham, mm -hmm. uh, who were doing work out of Tektronix, and a few other guys, and then a lot of academics. And, and uh, I very quickly understood that, first of all, most of academics, I'd just gotten my you know, degree in college, never heard of it. Most academics didn't hear of it either. It wasn't relevant. Mm -hmm. And then the academics that were there talking about objects, it's like, this just doesn't make sense. I do this every day, and what you're saying is so irrelevant. Yeah, they're talking about correct programs, and I'm thinking correct programs is one that people use and is helpful. <laughs> you know, it's not a mathematical formula here, guys. Yeah, yeah. do I throw and, all, uh, my, uh, all, all my C so very quickly? Or whatever. Yeah, so I very quickly got drawn to started participating in workshops at Oopsla and talk about this concept of object-oriented design. You know, we had object-oriented programming, nobody ever heard of object-oriented design, and uh, you know, got into workshops and started talking to guys like Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham and. Um, back in 1987, I pulled up this not too long ago, a paper that Kent and Ward wrote in 1987 about patterns in programming languages and how patterns can help us. And, uh, you know, for years we started talking about patterns. Years later we were, uh, you know, talking about rolling this out to the rest of the world and the patterns books started coming out. And eventually things like extreme programming, all of this came out of applying this. So a lot of that gets into uh, how I started teaching people. Because by, you couldn't, by you couldn't at, get this from college. Yeah, it, people were taking these very interesting topics that, and making them dull. <laughs> and, uh, and you were looking at, like, how can you convert this to something to be more consumable? Right. And then, you know, I found out, so other, other than uh, guys like, uh, well, you know, Kent had a computer science degree, but Ward had a double E or something. And mm -hmm. the more people I met, in this community that were people that were really doing great stuff, the more I realized how many didn't have a computer science degree. Um, I remember working with the guy one time, and he did something pretty cool, and I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. He says, yeah, not bad for a history major, is it? <laughs> and, um, you know, started recognizing that most of the best developers that I'd run into had had mentors. Um, you know, somebody who just helped them along, and they just really wanted to take the technology and apply it. And I um, you know, started realizing, well, if this is the case, and uh, you know, although you know, my computer science degree, I, I certainly don't want to say it had no value. It, it certainly did. It got me my first job. Um, but uh, I was recognizing that you know, if I want to help people learn how to do object oriented programming, it's a whole paradigm shift from anything they're teaching in, uh, in universities. Um, they're almost teaching it backwards. They teach performance first instead of you know, the mantra we came up with, you know, Kent and I and a couple others, make it run, make it right, make it fast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, performance comes last. Once you've got this thing down nice and clean, then yeah. if there's any performance left to tune out of it, then you tune it. Um, but people weren't being taught this. So I found that, you know, I'm constantly, as I'm working with my clients, um, I got into object oriented consulting uh, for a small company called Knowledge Systems mm -hmm. in the late 80s. And, um, it just grew as small talk and other things started growing and uh, constantly trying to teach people how this was different than the way they thought before and you know introducing GUIs and objects and stuff that was all brand new to most people um, found that boy you know having a computer science degree often got in the way um, sometimes it didn't you know some, it depended on whether people can make the jumps but I just found out mentoring was the most important thing and, and immersion, you know, just learning by doing it and having somebody who's done it around you. You know, my mentors were, were the guys who wrote the small talk library. You know, I spent all that time reading the code because it was the only object oriented code on the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you so reached that, out to them right, right. and then they kind of took you under their wing to help you to learn or did you I'm sorry? Start, did you <clears throat> I guess I should speak into the microphone. Um, <laughs> uh, so you were looking for a mentor and you were able to find a mentor in them. Um, is that a correct assessment of, of how that worked? Or did yeah, you well, eventually... Yeah, well, I mean, it quickly became, you know, again, we were, I mean, recognized, we were, we were the pioneers. So we go to, the first Oops, there was 600 people, you know, and probably three or 400 of them were academics. Right. Um, you know, I, I found out that, you know, at the, at the ripe old age of 25 with a couple of years under my belt that I was, I had more 
experience in building object oriented systems than most people on the planet. Um, and certainly looking for mentors, but there wasn't a whole lot to choose from. Okay. Um, so, you know, definitely meeting, meeting Kent and Ward, and, you know, we, we kind of, in many ways, became our own mentors, and you know, we just share experiences of, here's what I tried, how did that work, you know? And, right. Um, we were describing different patterns that showed up in the Gang of Four book, you know, eight years later, we didn't have a name for them at the time, but... <laughs> right. You were saying, yeah, I tried this thing, and, you know, ooh, and somebody, you know, somewhere later I found out that I implemented the proxy pattern, and I didn't know that it had a name. <laughs> just seemed to make sense, right? So how did that ultimately end up with you um, going into the, 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 the role of a mentor? Or how did you end up moving into uh, working with somebody as a mentor? How did, how did that eventually uh, culminate? Well, I mean, when I was hired at Knowledge Systems, I was working with uh, Sam Adams, who probably had about a year's worth more experience than I did. And you know, certainly learned a lot from Sam, and we learned a lot from each other. It was great to have a community of people having those ideas. But very quickly it became clear that, you know, in order to hire more people into knowledge systems and do something about small talk, there weren't a whole lot of people who had more than two or three years experience. Right, right. So we just had to find somebody who at least had spelled it and and uh, and used you know, used it for something. Right. And bring them on. Actually the most interesting one was uh Agneta, Agneta uh, Jakobsen. Uh, Ivar Jakobsen's daughter was just graduating college. Ivar was uh, coming out with the idea of refactory and wanted to turn it in, turn, build a software product around it, mm -hmm. and felt like, okay, well, I'll send my daughter to America. She can explore America, and uh, asked if she could live at Knowledge Systems and glean from us. And then we just, whenever we spent an hour with her teaching her, just rack up a bill and he'd pay the bill. Yeah, and that became an incredible experience because within three months, uh, now Agneta was a very very bright individual, but um, within three months we saw how much she learned by being in the environment of, I'm trying to solve this problem, here's what I think, here's the kind of stuff I need, how would you do this? And we'd spend time you know, walking her through how we would approach it, then she'd do something and show it to us and we review her code, and we watched that happen. Um, eventually we started having clients who said, we need more of your time, but we don't have a consulting budget. Right. And um, our, our owner, Reed Phillips, had this great idea of saying, well, how about we do what we did with Ineta, formalize it, we called it the Small Talk Apprenticeship Program, mm -hmm. and it ended up saying, you know, we take three people from a client, team them up with one of our people, and immerse them, just you basically get locked in a large room with these people, we build stuff together, and we right. talk through the principles and everything, and um, that was wildly successful. We'd see people who came through that program in three months, the masters versus the guys that were going back to it had a year experience, and uh, we just saw that this is the way it needs to be done. You know, immersion is is by far the best way to go. They were getting what would otherwise take several years to get. So and um, you, and, and they get to pay it out of their education budget for these people who didn't have any more consulting budget. So it, would, it worked out kind of good back then. And you used uh, you, you called it the apprenticeship program, or it had the word apprenticeship in it. Uh, there was, was there any precedent in software for apprenticeship programs at that time, or was this based off of of just taking a word that was seemed appropriate? Yeah, you know, I, I never heard of anything like that before. Um, I know that a few people kind of duplicated it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know when uh, Extreme Programming came out, Bob Martin had these XP immersion mm -hmm. things that they went several weeks, and you'd just sit down with Kent and a bunch of other guys. A bit in a room and just do stuff XP way, yeah. um, but I think as far as I know, the small dog apprenticeship program was really the first of its kind, and then several people duplicated it. Um, and I, I'm quite honestly, I don't know where they came, you know, who came up with the name. Um, we just said, how do we, how do we do this? Package it up in a way that we can sell to people who are spending money out of their education budget, because yeah. <laughs> you had to have a program to do that, right? You had to have a course. So, uh, you know, we called it a course, but it really spanned, uh, spanned about 10 weeks, you do about six weeks of immersion over 10 weeks. They get to go home and they drink from a fire hose, go home, swallow a little bit, come yeah. back, <laughs> yeah. drink some more. Gasping. Um, so, yeah. so fast forward a little bit to role model software and you're founding that. Uh, as I understand, it's, you've, from your original talk that I heard in 2009, that you've actually integrated role model software into your home, into your life, that 
there's the business and the home all in one um, uh, hum- I, I can't think of the right word, but integrated, uh, integrated. <laughs> thank you, uh, 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 lifestyle. Uh, so you, you have mentors come and they live in in a part of the house. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's confusing to me sometimes too. Um, no, really, I mean, so actually I'm sitting in our in a basement of our house. We, we designed this, but uh, we started the company before uh, before I designed this house. Uh, with the vision of basically recognizing that, um, you know, this whole idea of mentorship and just like you mentioned my faith, you know, I was, I was at the same time as I was learning how to be a better mentor and, and do more with software, I was also being trained in, in church leadership in a very intense um, kind of discipleship, apprenticeship type of program and just started recognizing, wow, this is really neat. And, and I had people going through that same thing with me that had seminary degrees and said, man, I never learned this stuff in seminary. Right. Um, this is just going through you know, the Bible and working with these men of God who've been leading churches and stuff. And um, they were saying what a great experience it was. So I just started seeing these patterns. And then you know, I had a daughter and had to figure out how to educate her. And I had started, heard about homeschooling. <laughs> so I started learning about homeschooling and found out, wow, you know, when you start homeschooling, your whole model of education changes drastically. So all this was was happening with me in the '90s. I didn't even know what was happening to me. You know, I, <laughs> I just was, you know, there. Um, stumbled upon the idea of doing it in software. Stumbled upon it in church leadership, and now I'm trying to raise my my own children mm-hmm. and figure out how to educate them. And just started seeing this pattern of wow, you know, when you actually live with people, um, the more experienced teaching the young, less experienced, and actually doing stuff. Education happens in a very different way than our traditional sit in the classroom, hear the lecture, take the test. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and again, not that there's no value for some of that. You know, uh, in fact, my daughter and I just, my daughter's now 21, and, and we, we sometimes speak at uh, homeschooling conferences. And one of, the, one of the reasons one we gave is the value of a, of a non-academic education and point out that a, a well-rounded education isn't just theory, but it's application. And they need to overlap, because theory without application is just head knowledge, right? Application without understanding the foundations of it gets you to come in up with practices that you think are smart, but you're missing off, right? right? So, um, you know, that's and that's kind of the way we do this uh, here. So when I started Role Model, uh, was kind of, again, I was just learning about homeschooling. Um, I needed to hire my first employee because I had more work to do than I could, and I couldn't afford a ho- college graduate that, that wanted more money than they were worth because mm-hmm. I knew that they're going to come out of college. They don't know anything about objects. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to have to pay them $50,000 a year for the privilege of teaching them. Yeah. I didn't think I wanted to do that. They spent a few hours a week working on some assignments that have no deadlines except for it's due for a grade and just get there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I tried an experiment with a couple of pretty bright high school guys and that didn't work out uh, for a variety of reasons, which we don't have time to get into. But then I eventually uh, stumbled across this homeschool guy, Nathaniel Talbot, who many people might know now, uh, who was looking for a mentor, trying to avoid having, you know, his parents said, look, you either got to find a way to get mentored and get a career or go to college. And he, mm-hmm. he wanted a mentor and I wanted a mentee. And uh, it just worked out great. So he came on board and, you know, I'd give him assignments and he'd do some other odds and ends and empty the trash can for me and whatever. And, uh, you know, it just started working out. And then after that, uh, after that worked out so well, within about a year and a half, Nathaniel was blowing away a lot of the people that I was working with the clients who had the computer science degrees and everything else. Um, Granted, Nathaniel was an unusual guy, but uh, guys who are hungry and want to learn, they tend to make the best apprentices. Right, right. So, uh, after doing that, we did another one the next year and just kind of, you know, probably average about one a year. Sometimes we had more than one going and others, but uh, really found out, you know, we're trying to get work done here. You can only have so much time where you're teaching the guys who don't know anything. But eventually, it doesn't take them that long until they start becoming the guys mentoring the next group of guys. And now it's, you know, more of an environment where the group is mentoring. Um, well, we, do, we did start a couple years ago the Craftsmanship Academy to kind of formalize the foundational part because what I'd find is the time out of time you need to pump into somebody for the first three to six months was just a lot and 
just to get the principles in there, the theory that they never got, <laughs> right. or the applied theory they never and, got. And, and so if, I made this immersion program a couple years ago to say the first the first few months are just going to be pretty intense, um, but after that, you know, as soon as they've gotten that, we we teach them the principles, teach them test first development, teach them a few other things, uh, how to build what good code looks like, why you review your code, don't just whip it together. Right. Um, you know, just uh, a lot of stuff. And then they just start working with the with the teams. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting how you were talking about um, once it, or it sounded like you were saying that the once their apprentices reach a certain level, they could sort of kind of support each other. And I've observed that uh, in my past in martial arts and also in uh, in my own little ones. Uh, my, my kids are much much, much younger than uh, your kids, but uh, starting to see them. I've got a seven-year-old still. Oh, okay. Well, i got a five and a, a two-year-old, and seeing the five-year-old sit down now and sing the alphabet to the two-year-old, and now the two-year-old is singing along with the five-year-old and how they they teach other each other, and it becomes kind of a, a self-regulating uh, machine, self-running machine, and, and I think a lot of that is just it's a very human way to learn. I just think that, uh, you know, Getting uh, um, a, a enough, uh, or raising the temperature of the room, the ambient temperature is what I like to call it. The ambient temperature of the room high enough that all of a sudden people start to be able to see things in each other and, and share and, and communicate. That's that's a whole value of community that I I really like to uh, 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 emphasize here on on uh, Yucatastic. So, um, and and. Talking about getting that message out, we talked about a little bit about how uh, you know you're open with your faith. It's it's the role model software um, has even has the cross in uh, in the in the logo, and it's it's a hard balance when you're dealing with a uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, community that has so many different uh, faiths or non-faiths. Uh, has it been a challenge, or has it been helpful? Uh, for you going out and sharing your message and also with that you're, you're, you live an integrated life and your faith is integrated into your life and into your career. Uh, right. Has that been a challenge or, 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 or um, help? Yeah, some days more challenging than others. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I was just reading Colossians yesterday and pointed, you know, Christ is first in everything. It takes first place in everything, and that's that's the way I live. So I can't. If he's going to be first place in everything, that means includes my work, right? And um, you know, I think it helps. My, most of my clients would say, you know, they're dealing with people who work with integrity. If we say we're going to do something, we do it. If we screw up, we admit to it. We make it right. Um, how does that affect my clients? Even the ones that aren't don't share my faith like that. Um, in fact, one of my uh, best clients, he he's a self proclaimed pagan, and uh, you know, he's but he's he appreciates our honesty. He's an honest guy himself, um, so that works out fine. Um, I do know that there's been people who won't work with us because they just uh, I don't know what they're afraid of. I mean, it's really interesting that the people who promote tolerance are very intolerant of people who don't share their faith. Um, and you know, one uh, early on, I had a, a good friend of mine who knew from the small talk community when I started my business. Um, shared with me when I when I showed my logo, my first website came up, and um, he said, you know, Ken, I appreciate your faith. He says, but, man, you got to feed your family. You know, you don't want to be advertising that. People are going to be turned off. you got to feed your family. And I said, well, you know, thanks for that advice, but I know who my provider is, and I'm eating fine. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and um, yes, that's the case. I, I definitely know that there are people who are turned off by it. Um, there were a lot of people who turned off by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, they still are. And, um, you know, for some reason, some people think that the worst thing in the world right now is somebody who actually has a faith and has a faith in Christ and, ha and believes that there's a thing called sin in the world. Um, you know, personally, I think sin in the world is a pretty big problem, and it was a pretty big problem in me, and I thank God I have a Savior who died for me. Right. Um, I don't want to hide that. Why should I hide it in the workplace? I mean, the whole idea that it shouldn't happen in the world, it, it better affect everything I do. Mm -hmm. um, and it does. So, um, but the, you know, it's the, definitely been a problem. I know when I had the Craftsmanship Academy website, there was uh, somewhere along the line I said, here's the behavior. And, and you know, I chose some wording that, yeah, I can see some people might be inflamed by it or whatever. So I changed the wording. 
But, you know, some people just had a fit and just started calling me all kinds of names. And it's like, look, man, I'm just trying to tell you that if you come here, this is what you're going to be dealing with. We have a biblical worldview. And when people don't act right, we're going to ask them to repent. And repent is a bad word to some people. Um, you know, the list of sins are great. <laughs> you know, from being, if you look in Romans, I mean, list, you know, things like being disobedient to parents. It's called sin. Um, right. There's all kinds of sins. And if we don't want to act like there's a thing called sin... We're going to be living in it, and there's going to be consequences to that. So, um, you know, we call people to repent when they act poorly uh, with each other. Um, if they're leading destructive lifestyles, we would call them to repent of that. It doesn't mean you're fired, you're shot, you're, you should be put in jail. <laughs> right. You know, I'm not out there trying to hate monitor, but I am going to say, hey, this is Jesus yeah, Christ died for me. He's God, and there's a thing called sin. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should repent from it. That's what he asked people to do. Yeah. Um, so some people just say, well, I don't share that faith, but I'll work with you anyway. And others just, you know, leave skid marks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll openly say I was one of those people that had a uh, kind of a visceral reaction at first to uh, what I thought was a um, negative statement on the, on, the, uh, on the posting. And it was more that I was frustrated because I know what you're doing is good and um, and that it helps more people than getting hooked on one line and it's better to look at somebody holistically um, what they're what they're doing and what their intent and kind of where their heart is uh, than to get too hung up on one aspect uh, you know that we live in a pluralistic society and that uh, you know you think one thing I think another but as long as we can live in somewhat reasonable harmony that's what matters and I just was most interested in in, in exactly what you described is it, the uh, how that how how trying to share your uh, how trying to communicate your message of craftsmanship and software and professionalism and mentorship and getting people to adopt those um, well they're secular uh, secular perspectives while trying to balance uh, not getting your message misconstrued or or hindered by people getting hung up on on the fact that you're also sharing it with the message of your faith. Um, yeah, it's um, you know it's interesting is the the word tolerance. I mean, originally the the whole idea of tolerance is you tolerate people who think differently than you. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I try to do that. I tolerate people who think I, I've hired some of them. You know, they don't. Not everybody here is, shares my same faith. Um, we certainly have clients that don't. Um, some, in a flaming way, don't. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, if they can tolerate it, great. You know, I have to tolerate their differences. They tolerate my differences. Um, I believe in tolerance. I think tolerance is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to see it. I don't see it. I want tolerance to go back to what it meant, right? Tolerance isn't freedom from religion, right? Tolerance is freedom of religion. <laughs> right. right. I mean, if a Muslim's going to work next to me or, or, uh, or a Jewish man or, or a, a self-proclaimed pagan, I mean, that's, I can work next to them, right. you know, and I'll tolerate certain things. I, there's certain things I won't tolerate, um, and there's certain things they won't tolerate. So, uh, you know, if we can, if we can get past those things, we can work together. If we can't, we can't. But uh, I'm not going to change who I am, and I'm not going to deny my Lord. I mean, people have died for that before in history, and yeah. uh, if I have to die for it someday, I will. I hope it's not tomorrow. <laughs> I hope not. I hope but, you're, uh, you're teaching and 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 sharing the uh, the concepts of mentorship for a very long time, because, uh, uh, like I said, I, I think what is important is the message of improving ourselves and each other and sharing, uh, than getting hung up on any particular thing and. Uh, um, so yeah, that, that's that's that was my main perspective. Great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Sure.